see it. I don't know. As with many of these passages, it's a, a, an embarrassment of riches. There's too many plausible explanations. Well, okay. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked round at everything, as it was already late, uh, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. That's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? Uh, he, there's this big uh, build-up. The whole crowd is there with him and uh, praising him and, and so forth. And, and he takes a look at the temple. Oh, boy, what's he going to do there? Nothing. He's just going to look around. Hmm, hmm. Okay, time to go back to bed. He's just uh, ticked off. Uh, just a minor irritation. And I like this, and you can, you can do the same. <laughs> Provided... You don't have any doubt. Uh, and it, it's as if Jesus had actually done it. And they pointed it out. What the heck did you do that? He said, well, I, uh, I was uh, giving you a lesson. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's the book. Uh, and tried to um, turn the conversation to the virtues of faith. Uh, but it wasn't Jesus who did it. It was Mark, right? He's trying to make that, that anecdote look not so bad. Uh, and uh, whether he put, maybe you could take this more seriously had uh, it not been used that way. Suppose it was just in, in no particular context. And um, and Jesus just says this about faith. Well, that would sound. Uh, anyway, uh, in this, uh, Kirk, McCoy, uh, Scotty, Spock, and um, Chekhov, uh, are uh, placed in this uh, this scenario by an alien being who's kind of searched their minds, and it has a setup to an experiment. He has the five Enterprise crewmen play the roles of the uh, the Clanton gang, and they have this impending gunfight uh, with Doc Holliday and and uh, the Earps, uh, Wyatt. Uh, Oh boy, I used to know all the names. Uh, Morgan and uh, I forget the other one. But um, they know how it's supposed to end. Uh, what are they going to do? How are they going to get out of this? It's all kind of an illusion, but it's so real that they're not going to be able to, to uh, keep that in mind. Well, they managed to get some chemicals and Spock makes up some knockout bombs to use against the herbs. And he he says, we better try one first. And uh, so they, uh, one of them, Scotty, I think, breathes the stuff right in. Nothing, no result. And they said, oh, well, what'd you do? Would you do something wrong? Ingredients no good? And Spock says, no, no, I, I know this must have worked. Uh, by the laws of science, it had to work. So I can only conclude that this is a, an imposed illusion. And so are the bullets the herbs are going to fire at us. If we believe that they are bullets, and it's going to be hard not to, you know, bang, here it comes, um, that uh, they, they will kill us. The bodies will react as if they were shot through. And uh, But I don't have to worry because I know by pure logic that uh, this has to be an illusion. So it won't bother me. And then Kirk says, yeah, but you have the mind control of a Vulcan. We're, we humans cannot banish doubt to such a degree. We're still going to get killed. And, and so Spock does the old mind meld with him to, uh, to instill in them uh, sort of siphoned off from him or telepathically shared with him so that they will know that these bullets are phantom and cannot harm them. And sure enough, they uh, empty in their guns, trying to shoot at Kirk and the others, doesn't harm them, doesn't phase them. Well, that's the problem here. Being human, you couldn't really exercise the last particle of doubt. But unless you do, this ain't going to work. So my guess is it has never worked. Uh, so it's a funny thing, a kind of self-contradictory uh, uh, element and not the only one. I once wrote a whole article and it's called uh, 
uh, the retreat from radical prayer, where I uh, explored how the New Testament steps further and further away from these broad promises. Okay, now I've said this was a mark and sandwich. Uh, what are the other pieces of bread involved? Because it's the fig tree, the, uh, well, it's looking at the, uh, getting the layout of the temple. Um, oh, I'm sorry, cursing the fig tree, seeing the layout of the temple, the next day seeing the fig tree withered, and then the cleansing of the temple, right? The, those four pieces were originally grouped differently. Okay, so verse 15. They came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. What, what were they doing there? I love the temple cleansing scene in uh, in uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, where it's like racks of tourist postcards, and they're having cockfights in there and uh, selling souvenirs and and so forth. Uh, and uh, to to accentuate the idea that you've made it into a market bazaar kind of deal. Well, that isn't exactly what uh, Mark described. Uh, why are there money changers? Well, because you couldn't use uh, in order to buy your, well, let's start the, with this. Uh, uh, the Old Testament stipulated that you had to bring animals to be sacrificed at Passover, slain ritually, and then you would uh, cook them up. Um, you, uh, you had to bring them. But uh, there was always the problem of, uh, since it was quite a journey uh, and up into hilly country, there was a decent chance you might, your lamb that you're bringing might break its leg on the way up and then you're stuck, you're screwed. Uh, well, uh, to avoid that, the, uh, the temple establishment said, look, we will maintain a stock of inspected animals. You can buy one there. There's no real chance it's going to get crippled between the pen and the altar. So uh, don't worry, we'll make it easier for you. There was a problem with that, as Bruce Chilton points out, because it, it sort of alienates the, uh, the person who offers the sacrifice from the sacrifice because this is not really his lamb that he's sacrificing. Yeah, it, it amounts to the same thing because he did buy it, uh, but... Still, uh, it's it's there's a step inserted between the offerer and the offering, and that kind of starts to break down the whole system. Well, uh, uh, Jesus wants to stop the whole machine, so he throws a monkey wrench in there, and uh, so he is. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. To buy those sacrificial animals you couldn't use Roman denarii because they had images of Caesar on them. And remember, no graven images of anything in the heavens above or the earth below or the waters under the earth. Uh, so uh, technically, those coins are idolatrous. Yeah, you can use them in everyday commerce, uh, what the heck, uh, naturally, but but uh, not for buying a sacrifice you're going to offer to God. You got to have non-iconic, non-image bearing coins, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew coins and Phoenician coins that just had like fig trees on them and such. And uh, so uh, if you don't happen to have any on you, you've only got the filthy lucre minted by Caesar, uh, then uh, you're going to have to go to the exchange table and uh, cash in your, uh, your Roman money for good Orthodox Hebrew money. Uh, well, these exchange tables are what Jesus threw over uh, so that uh, you can't buy the animals anymore. Uh, so good luck with the sacrifice. And similarly, uh, there were other sacrifices involving pigeons, for instance, for different occasions. And uh, so he um, 
yeah, he overthrew the, the seats of those who sold the pigeons. And, he would, and now we get into, in deeper. And uh, he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Well, actually, it says the the skewane, the the uh, vessels used for the sacrificial rituals. So who would be carrying those? Priests and Levites. And Jesus is forbidding them to bring the stuff in. So again, he's stopping the sacrifice. And um, how did he m expect to pull this off? Are these people going to stop just because this nut off the street tells them to? No. Uh, no, the idea is, as, as Brandon and others point out, if this happened, it assumes that Jesus had a big armed force that could occupy the court of the Gentiles where all this stuff was going on, uh, and that he could post men at the entrance or the doors between the court of the Gentiles and the actual uh, uh, nave, I guess it is, of the temple, uh, and because the Gentiles couldn't go all the way in and observe the worship and sort of participate in it from from the sidelines but they couldn't under pain of death go in there actually uh so um jesus must have uh, had armed men forbidding the the priests and levites to go in there and so again it all stopped uh, abruptly uh, and uh and this you know uh during passover season that's when most jews thought that the messiah would come Maybe it won't be this year, but maybe it will. But whatever year, it's going to be at Passover. So they would leave an empty seat at the Seder table for him in case he showed up, right? And uh, so um, there were loads of people who come in from all over the Holy Land. So the population increased like threefold or more uh, during that uh, those few days. And because of that, the temple, which was always... Uh, uh, they always had uh, priestly uh, guards stationed all over it. They had double that during the Passover season. Armed guards, why? Well, in case something like this happened and there would be an altercation. Why wasn't there? Well, you might say, well, they don't want to have a bloodbath in the holy temple, not human blood. Well, okay, but why did they have guards there then? I mean, surely they, they were there to be used if needed, and this would seem to be one of those times. So uh, that being the case, you got a couple of options. Either this didn't happen, as some scholars say, um, and plus the fact that it seems... Mark seems to think of it as a small space. It's as if a guy barged into a church rummage sale and started throwing out all this stuff. No, no, uh, the court of the Gentiles was the length of several football fields, one after the other. It was huge. Uh, imagine, uh, how could he have stopped this in an area like that? Well, Mark apparently doesn't know that that's what it was. He didn't, I mean, you saw already that he didn't know the difference between the, the uh, kosher laws of Palestinian versus diaspora Jews. Apparently, he didn't know this either. Um, and so it's fiction. Uh, or... Uh, based on the two passages we're about to read that uh, give Jesus his script. Um, or it did happen, but it was much more of a big deal than Mark wanted you to know, that it was a, uh, a, a, an armed conflict. Now, Mark has that begin abortively in the Garden of Gethsemane, though, as John says, there were like hundreds of men there to arrest him. That doesn't seem likely. But it does if this is where that altercation occurred. Uh, so maybe there was a pitched fight between Jesus' armed men and uh, those of the temple guard. Uh, and perhaps Jesus was even arrested right there in the earlier version. I drew up a hypothetical version of proto-Mark uh, where I tried to eliminate what seems to me later additions and that's the way it happens. 
Uh, but uh, it's very confusing. And what does Jesus say? Well, he quotes Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, he, verse 17, he taught and said to them, is it not written, my father, uh, well, sorry, God saying, uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, right? Well, that's where they are, the court of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish nations. Um, but you have made it a den of robbers, the first one is from Isaiah, the second from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is denouncing the hypocrisy of, of uh, the, the priesthood and so on. He says, to you, the temple has just become a place for your crooks to get together and, you know, uh, plan their crimes and parcel out the loot. It's disgusting. Uh, you, you forfeited God's protection because, you know, the Babylonians were on their way and Nebuchadnezzar was going to loot and destroy the temple. Well, no surprise, given that uh, this was going on there. In verse 18, and the chief priests and the scribes heard it and sought a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Uh, so they're in hot water because Jesus is condemning them. And, you know, just based on the analogy of history, most people probably kind of thought that already. They're probably ripping us off at those exchange tables and so on and so on. They collect the taxes for Rome in there, which they also did. And uh, so they're probably saying, yeah, Jesus, give it to him again. But, you know, technically, there really isn't even a saying of Jesus in here. Now, maybe he's cobbling together memory quotes from different Old Testament books, but I kind of think that's more likely that Mark would do it. He wants Jesus to sound like a, you know, a flaming prophet. And so how best to uh, manage to make him sound that way than to have him quote a couple of the big time prophets. It's just like the baptism scene, where in order to make the divine voice sound like God, let's cobble together about three different uh, parts of, of utterances that God made in the Old Testament. That ought to do it. So I think that's probably happened here. Well, now Mark gives you this the, uh, the continuation of the fig tree thing, which we've already discussed. Now, I suspect, again the whole thing was wrapped up, the whole fig tree uh, parts A and B, before, like on their way into the temple initially. Uh, and uh, then he, he cleanses the temple, he throws everybody out. Uh, and then my guess is that the continuation was immediately in verse 27. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? I mean, after all, it's a pretty touchy stuff, right? How dare he interrupt the sacrifices and so on. In 29, Jesus said to them, I will ask you, I, I'm sorry, I will ask you a question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Uh, fair enough, right? Uh, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? That is, where did he get his authority, right? Uh, did God tell him to do it, or was it his own idea? Um, answer me. Uh, and then they form a huddle, at least that's how I picture it. Uh, and they argued with one another, no doubt in whispers. Um, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? Uh, they were afraid of the people for all held that John was a real prophet. So they answered Jesus, oh, we do not know. Uh, and Jesus said to them, and why am I not surprised? He said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, that's interesting. Is he just saying, uh, I know you're trying to trap me. Uh, I'm not playing along. 
uh, I, now I will answer if you'll answer a trick question and and it works they figure well okay i guess he outsmarted us but what what ex is it possible that there's a little more to jesus reply Joachim Jeremias, one of the immortal, uh, terrifically great New Testament scholars, uh, he said that he thinks the logic here is that um, that Jesus is saying, well, my authority came from John the Baptist, but I think his authority came from God. So uh, it's all up to you. You decide. Uh, if if you think John had cooked up the baptism ministry all by himself, well, then I guess you'll say the same about me. But answer your question as if asked to John the Baptist, and uh, what and whatever you come up with, well, that'll apply equally to me. Could be. Now, it, I've always read this as he's just, as I say, answering one trick question with another, but they they're both kind of together. Uh, you don't really have to choose between them. Uh, but what Yeremia says is pretty interesting. Uh, it, the Bible doesn't exactly say uh, that uh, Jesus got his mandate from John the Baptist, but it does come pretty close, right? Because it's through the baptism that John practiced that the Holy Spirit entered into Jesus, which gave him the authority to do all this stuff. So uh, maybe Yeremias was right. I don't always agree with him, but uh, a guy as learned as he was, uh, in especially in all of these relevant matters, you got to take what he says seriously. We're going to have another uh, another one. Well, I guess we could uh, breach the Great Barrier and um, uh, get into Chapter Twelve. Um. Yeah. Uh, why not? And he began to speak to them in parables. A man paint. Uh, I can't seem to read tonight. A man planted a vineyard, and set a hedge around it, a fence, right? Uh, and dug a pit for the wine press, and built a tower, and let it out to rented it out to tenants, and went into another country. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. You know, in other words, it's a sharecropping uh, arrangement, right? You can keep most of the harvest, but it is my land, so you got to give me a cut of it. Right? Uh, when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, uh, uh, he sent to them another servant, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. Uh, and so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He, you'd think the uh, vineyard owner would kind of have learned his lesson, right? Well, the, the plausibility of the story as a story begins to fade quickly. But again, that's not the real point of the story, right? It's just a setup for the punchline. That's where the action is. Okay, verse 6. He had still one other, a beloved son. I mean, that's all he had left, in other words. So he wouldn't have sent the son uh, if he'd had any more servants, right? But it finally comes down to him. Uh, they will respect my son, uh, verse 7. But those tenants said to one another, Hey, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. What kind of kooky thinking is that? Well, it isn't actually. According to the laws of the region at the time, uh, if, the, um, if there were no living heirs, and the owner died, it would pass to the occupant, squatter's rights. Well, they assume that uh, the uh, father is dead uh, because, uh, after all, he he gave he ran through all his servants and sent his uh, only son. Apparently, they somehow know he's the only son of the vineyard owner, and they figure, well, there's nobody left to inherit it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but us. So let's be, uh, uh, let's figure out some way for the sun to meet with a nasty accident. And so it happens. Verse 8, And they took him, and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. Now, what is all this about? Well, it, of course, the, uh, the vineyard owner is God. Uh, he's created it, and the, the vineyard is Israel. And the, uh, the, uh, the servants of the landowner are the prophets. And one after another, they went to, uh, to, to the people and demanded God's share of the crop. In other words, repentance. And that's why you have the, the interlocking of the fig tree and the temple cleansing. Jesus goes to the fig tree to get some fruit uh, to eat, but it's coupled with the temple where he goes to see if divine worship is really being offered. And in both cases, he's disappointed. And in, in this parable continues that theme. Right, all the prophets were going to collect the repentance of the people after they preached, uh, but they didn't get it, and so uh, God finally has is sending His only and beloved Son, and you know the same thing is going to happen to Him, right? So that's what they're really getting at. Okay, uh, let's see uh, verse nine. Jesus asked the crowd, "What will the owner of the vineyard do?" He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Uh, it was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I mean, what a surprise, right? The experts say, uh, this really won't do for a cornerstone, but they're wrong. Uh, and then somebody points out, no, that this is it. This is the cornerstone. Uh, and wow, you know, how did these guys get this wrong? And how did they avoid the big mistake they were about to make? Well, God somehow arranged it. And what he's going to do in the history that the parable symbolizes is take the vineyard away from its religious leaders, uh, the, the temple staff mainly, and maybe the scribes, uh, and because uh, they they've just been milking the situation, uh, they don't really care, and uh, and so uh, God is they're not giving God his share, genuine repentance and worship, and so he's going to just wipe them out and replace them with others. Now, who's that supposed to mean? Uh, my guess is it means the. Uh, uh, some have thought it means instead, especially once you get to Matthew, who rewrites this a bit, some have thought he means uh, Rome will become the uh, the vineyard owner, but they already were, really, if, that's, if you want to get into the political bit, because by this time, this whole area was just part of the Roman Empire. I, you know, I don't know if that one fits very well. It, it does in Matthew, because he says it a bit differently, but... Uh, not really in this one. Um, okay, so verse 12, they, the scribes presumably, tried to arrest him, but feared the multitude, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Uh, Jeremias again, he, he realized that this kind of looks like something Jesus would only, well, that, that Christians would only have said afterward, after they knew the religious leaders had kicked Jesus literally out of a city, out of the city wall into Golgotha, right? Uh, and, uh, and so they, and the only, the beloved son, that, that just sounds too much like Christian theology. So, uh, Jeremias was trying to rescue it as something that the historical Jesus really did say. So his approach was to say, uh, no, Jesus isn't really hinting that he is the son of God about to be sacrificed. I mean, we can look at it that way, coincidentally, I guess. But it's, he said, it's simply a function of this notion of who inherits if, uh, if there's no legal heir. 
So the, the son has to be involved and gotten out of the way for the, uh, the uh, sharecroppers to think they can get away with killing him and, and getting a hold of the, the uh, vineyard themselves. I don't find that very convincing. I mean, why even use, <laughs> I turn it around, why would you use that particular possible metaphor unless you were trying to explain a scenario where the forfeiture of leadership in Israel was the result of killing God's son? Uh, so I, I don't buy it. I think he, he was a little, he was too biased like an apologist to rescue the historical uh, accuracy of this thing. Uh, well, here is, I think I may finish with this and we'll see. In verse 13, we have a very, very famous uh, pericope or passage. They sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to entrap him in his talk. Uh, what do they need for, uh, both of them for? Well, the Herodians apparently were Galilean civil authorities working for Herod Antipas. And so they're about to ask Jesus a question that might incriminate him in the eyes of the law. So, um, uh, 14, they came to him and uh, they came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care for no man. Like, you know, uh, you don't... Uh, gives special weight to people's opinions because they're rich and you want to please them. Now, you're, you talk straight to anybody, no matter who they are. Uh, for you do not regard the position of men, but truly teach the way of God. So they're buttering them up, right? Um, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, of course, by Roman law it is, but they mean by the law of God. Would this be a compromise? Uh, is it a Caesar supposed to be a god somehow? So would it be idolatry to, to do this? I mean, we're doing it, but should we? Because like the zealots say, hell no. Uh, that just shows servitude. We have no Lord, but God Almighty, not these bums. Uh, and so they were in big trouble, right? These are the guys who's at least they're the next generation, stopped the temple sacrifices offered for God's protection of the Roman government. Uh, and, uh, and, and that led to the war between uh, uh, Jerusalem and Rome. And so they're trying to kind of bring it on or at least have Jesus look like a radical who wants it to happen, right? Um, should we pay them or should we not? <laughs> this ought to be good, right? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a coin, and, or literally a denarius, and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Uh, and they said, uh, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, well then, Render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and to God the things that belong to God. And they were amazed then, and they hadn't thought of that. What is that supposed to mean? Is it a church-state separation issue? No, no, that's anachronistic. What he must mean is that you know, why can't you use Roman coins to buy temple sacrifices? Because they're technically idolatrous. They're minted uh, independent, disregarding the commandment of no graven images. I mean, the Gentiles don't have to worry about that. God doesn't uh, expect them to uphold the provisions of the Torah. Uh, but uh, um, we Jews can't do it right? So that's why we have money changers. If all we have is regular commercial exchange money minted by Rome, well, we can use it for that, but we can't use it for holy purposes in the temple. Uh, so um, but so what, what about the denarii? You can't give them to God. You can't use them to buy sacrificial animals, which is why we have to change them. So you see, 
uh, the the holy money belongs to God, uh, and we pay that, like the temple tax, right? But the the secular money uh, with the, the that you can't use for God, why not give it to Caesar? He had admitted it belongs to him, and God doesn't want it. There's no compromise involved here. Holy mackerel, son of a gun, he's right. So Jesus is doing this kind of rabbinic. I don't want to say hair splitting because that that means somebody is you know using too fine an instrument here, uh, so to speak. But this seems to me to be a very reasonable um, answer in terms of Jewish halakha, the the legal system and its debates. Uh, there, he's saying you can be a good Jew with without worrying about paying taxes to Caesar pay him what the heck it's just it has no religious or anti-religious value so he uh, he doesn't exactly just slip out of it right he he said I got a point and wins the argument some of the things Jesus says as Burton Max says you can't really imagine non-christians being convinced uh, it's, they just sound good to Jesus fans but this I think is is halakically quite legitimate um, well, let's see here there's there's some discussion here um, I uh, don't think it's uh, there are really questions about what we're um, uh, talking about, though they're interesting observations. But uh, that's, uh, I, I do have, yeah, a little bit of time for questions about the, the content we've uh, gone over tonight. If anybody wants, to, and they, these aren't even questions, right? They're good observations. But if anybody has any questions about uh, my rantings on the Gospel of Mark, I'd be delighted to hear them and uh, come up with some kind of answers. So fire away. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, none yet. Um, if there aren't any pretty quick, I'm going to need to get off a little earlier than usual. I have a call coming in I need to take, and uh, but I still do have a little window of time. Uh, the next thing I want to do on the show, oh boy, now this is a, I do have a question. Peter Rabbit says, what stories from Mark come from Hebrew scripture? I think almost all of them. Uh, you can see this in my uh, uh, book. Uh, what is it? I think it's the, the the Christ myth theory and its problems, where I go over the whole thing and provide the the texts of the Old and New Testament involved. But let's take a fast look back through Mark, and uh, you'll see what I'm getting at here. Uh, let's see. Um, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. That probably comes from either or both of Moses and Elijah spending 40 days or 40 years in the desert. Um, uh, the uh, calling stories of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and then later Levi, uh, surely seem to be based on the story of Elijah recruiting Elisha. Uh, whereupon he just leaves his family in the lurch and follows the, the senior prophet. Okay. Um, uh, the story where uh, G Peter invites Jesus to his house and uh, expects his mother-in-law to make him dinner, but turns out she's sick, and Jesus raise, heals her, raises her up off the sick bed, and she makes lunch for him. That seems to be one of several uh, reshufflings of the elements in the story where uh, during the famine in the land, Elijah, uh, he's caused it, and he goes to Tyre and finds a woman there who is uh, starving, and 
she's gathering sticks for a fire and Elijah says, what are you doing, ma'am? And he says, well, we, we've run out of food. I just have enough uh, meal for, you know, on half a pancake or something for my son and me. And then we're going to curl up and croak. Uh, and he says, well, actually, why don't you make that for me? I mean, that, that again is a sort of Socratic question. He knows it's obnoxious, but it's a test of her faith and a prophet. And so she says, okay, why not? And and uh, does it. And then, um, oh, let's see. Then eventually, I believe uh, he, he has to, when I lost my place here. Um. Uh, he uh, the prophet heals the boy uh, and or saves him from starvation. Well, you're going to have the same cast of characters, though, with different names flipped around a bit. But I think uh, uh, that uh, Thomas L. Brody is right that all of them come from that. Uh, see. Mm. The leper uh, being cleansed. Uh, that certainly comes, uh, the, such stories are told in the Old Testament, like Naaman the Syrian, who was cleansed by Elisha uh, from his leprosy. And uh, the paralytic who uh, gets, his stretcher gets lowered through the roof. That seems to be based on the story of uh, King Ahaziah, I think, who uh, falls through the lattice onto the floor and is severely injured and sends a servant to consult with the oracle of Beelzebub in uh, Ta in uh, Ekron, uh, the Philistine deity, to ask, am I going to recover? And But he doesn't get that far because Elijah meets him, having been told about this by God. And he says to the guy, hey, is there no God in, in Israel that you got to go to a foreign country? Well, I know what you're asking. Tell your boss that... Uh, because of his lack of faith, he is going to die. How do you like them apples? Whereas in uh, in the Jesus story, it's because of the faith of the guy's friends that he is successfully lowered through the roof, but is raised up. Ooh, how about... Um, well, Levi again, that's like the fisherman being recruited... Uh, the uh, the fasting thing. Why don't Why don't your disciples fast? Well, there's this implicit quote from Ecclesiastes. There's a time to fast. There's a time to eat, uh, and uh, you know, don't uh, don't do one when you're supposed to be doing the other. Uh, the uh, going through the the grain field on the Sabbath is based on both the law about gleaning and the prototype story of David feeding his men with the sacred bread that you're not or ordinarily supposed to eat uh, as a precedent for model for what they're doing here. Um, oh, let's see. There are various summary statements. Uh, um, okay, the thing in chapter three about him uh, choosing the disciples and also uh, rebuffing his family who come to visit him because they hear that he's so busy he's going to burn out and go crazy. That comes from uh, the from Exodus 18 where Jethro brings um, his daughter Moses' wife and their kids to see Moses after the Exodus is finished and he sees that Moses is busy all day and he's afraid he's going to lose it if he doesn't get some help and he urges him to set up a set of his lower courts to handle most of the cases that's what I think Mark used to write his thing about the relatives and the uh, the uh, naming of the 12 to share Jesus's work. The, uh, let's see, the parables, I guess they're a little bit different. Um, they deal with uh, Palestinian agriculture and customs and the like. Uh, the story of uh, 
Jesus being awakened in the boat and stilling the storm, that is modeled closely on Jonah. Uh, the Gerasene demoniac in chapter 5 seems to come from uh, Homer's Odyssey. And as you'll remember, and, uh, oh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter is much like that of one of, uh, I think it's Elijah, uh, one of his uh, miracles where he sends, a, he's called upon by the parent and he puts out all the other people there and goes into the room by himself and raises her up. And let's see. Even the thing where Jesus is in the synagogue and the crowd first praises him and then rejects him. Uh, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of uh, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? You know, how did he learn all this? That's kind of, that much of it is uh, probably derived from uh, this weird story in 1 Samuel where uh, to befit him to be the king, uh, I think Samuel tells Saul to go to some ridge somewhere where he'll come upon a uh, a group of sectarian uh, Pentecostals, basically, who are prophesying to the accompaniment of music, and uh, and and he is overcome and and falls to the ground and starts prophesying or speaking in tongues uh, himself. And from that, the narrator says, comes the proverb. So is Saul then also among the prophets? It's a little weird for a proverb. I'm not sure how it would apply to anything but this. But that is that is kind of similar to this. This is Saul. Okay, he's a king, he's a warrior, but what the heck? Since when is he a prophet? I suspect uh, that's correct. So even this has a uh, an important note from the Old Testament. When he sends out uh, the uh, the prophets and so on, this kind of uh, uh, let's see, is this the one where he says, "Don't tell anyone"? No, I guess that's uh, added in Matthew. Uh, the instruction of not uh, pausing to confer with anybody that comes from what Elisha tells. Gehazi to do when he sends him with his staff to uh, awaken the dead. Um, uh, the story of uh, about John the Baptist's beheading and uh, him getting uh, and Herod Antipas kind of liking John, being henpecked into a, arresting him and finally executing him after he foolishly makes this extravagant promise to his stepdaughter. That comes right out of Esther, uh, where uh, Esther goes to see her husband, the king, and she knows she might be in big trouble. But instead, he says, oh, yeah, any request you want to make, up to half my kingdom. That's the basis of this. Mm hmm. The miraculous feedings, both of them, uh, are retellings of Elisha being given a certain amount of oil, not very much, as a charitable gift by somebody to feed his apprentices, the sons of the prophets who all live together in a sort of monastery. And he multiplies the, the, the oil so everybody can eat. Well, that's got to be the, the basis of this. Um, and the, the bread, well, there's Moses giving him the manna. Well, what do you think? What's more likely that uh, this incredible miracle, it's hard even to picture in your mind, really happened, or that it is a retelling of a well-known story? Uh, I think it would have to be the latter. Uh, the walking on the sea. Uh, that uh, seems to be another version of uh the stilling of the storm with a resurrection appearance added. Uh, I'm not sure if that one has an old, old Testament prototype. The hand washing. 
I don't know if that does either. Um, it's not really a story with the the core band thing. That's really all uh, legal uh, decisions, and it does reflect the Mishnah, not an Old Testament narrative. Um, Yeah, the story of the Syrophoenician woman and getting Jesus to heal her daughter, a demon-possessed lion in the bed back home. Uh, this seems to be another version of uh, Elijah going to Tyre, the same place, and doing the miracle for uh, the mother and her son. This time it's a mother and a daughter. And uh, let's see. Yeah, then you got the other feeding story based on Elisha and the sons of the prophets. And the various uh, healings that are basically generically paralleled in the Old Testament. And... Um, the transfiguration with the shining garments and all that stuff and Moses being present. That's based on the Deuteronomic statement that from your own uh, people, God will raise up a prophet like me and whoever doesn't listen to him will be in big trouble. And uh, this is the same Moses whose face shone like the sun when he left the tent of meeting. And all those elements are in here. As he shines, he's... Uh, uh, when he comes out of a tabernacle and on the mountain, uh, Peter mentions, should we build some tabernacles for you guys? And uh, so forth. Um, uh, let's see. Some of the, uh, the exorcisms is just sort of generic. Uh, and... Uh, Uh, we're almost up to where we are. Uh, the stuff about the cutting the hand off, plucking the eye out, chopping the foot off. The descriptions of Gehenna are direct quotes from Isaiah to, I think, maybe the last uh, chapter of Isaiah. And so the, the idea of Gehenna is, uh, the, is the spine on which the rest is uh, padded. Uh, that seems to be derived from um, Isaiah, and if you didn't have it, you wouldn't have much of a story here. Uh, the uh, the divorce passage, that's uh, really a comparison of one Old Testament passage with another. Um, and do we have... Oh. Well, I, I guess that's mainly it. And as we've seen, the, the triumphal entry is in large measure based on Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But also, I should have mentioned this, Zechariah, where it says, O daughter of Israel, behold, your, your king comes to you uh, humbly riding on the, a donkey, the foal of an ass. Well, that, of course, is what he's acting out. So that's based on that, too. Hmm, let's see now. Three things fishing is somebody's pseudonym. Any credence to the theory that the Gospels were intended to be fiction from the beginning, like they were originally creative writing assignments for Greek students in an ancient Roman university? Well, uh, I go along with the Burton Mack and Vernon Robbins, who say that the, the phenomenon of uh, coining sayings for Jesus. It's kind of like the button people wore back in the 90s. What would Jesus do? Well, in uh, the in, uh, Greek, Greco-Roman education, to make sure the students 
understood the philosophy of Diogenes, Socrates, etc., they would be assigned to write up a little anecdote with a punchline. What would Socrates say in a case like this? Not that he actually said it, but if you can come up with something that sounded like Socrates, you get an A. They did that. So I think uh, coining a bunch of the sayings attributed to Jesus were very closely analogous to that. Uh, what we're just talking about, gospel stories being rewritten from uh, Old Testament stories, which I go along with Marcus Vincent thinking that Marcion was the guy that started doing that. He must have known these things were, were not actual events, but were object lessons. Uh, so in that case, I'd say that that theory is probably pretty sound. And uh, I, I don't quite agree with the uh, the renewed love for the allegorical method of uh, interpreting these things, uh, but um, I think a lot of them were just straight literary creations. And who knows whether the authors wanted to be uh, wanted their readers to think that their uh, their work was a blow-by-blow -blow historical account as long as they were educated morally by it, spiritually. But to a great degree, I think that's uh, that's certainly right. Um, let's see. Is there anything... Oops. Uh... Peter says, can you elaborate on faith, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, the effectiveness of healings, etc.? Well, psychosomatic healings do happen. Um, again, Freud, hysterical conversion symptoms and all of that. If you can penetrate to whatever the trauma was that led to this as a way of manifesting it, because the subconscious does that in order to, to keep tapping you on the shoulder, Freudian slips, dreams, hysterical blindness. It's trying to say, look, you got to deal with this if you're ever going to be whole again. It produces these symptoms. And uh, that can be healed if you can dig out what the problem was. Uh, that isn't just faith, but perhaps that's uh, something like abreaction therapy, uh, where they found that after World War II, I guess it was, uh, if uh, people have PTSD, and uh, if they could be induced to try to relive it and, and undergo the trauma again, that would uh, solve it. They had sort of exorcised it from themselves. Um, and uh, so uh, maybe exorcism was creating a battle against uh, the things that, that uh, had caused these physically manifesting symptoms. I wouldn't be surprised. That would make a lot of sense to me. But you notice there's some things that uh, nobody heals, including Jesus. He, he doesn't restore rotting corpses, right? They think Lazarus is one, but... They don't know that. They buried him days before. Um, and uh, he, uh, he doesn't restore missing limbs, except in Luke in Gethsemane, where he puts a guy's severed ear back on his head. But that's a result of a mistake, uh, misinterpreting a tradition where it said, Jesus said, put, uh, referring to the Peter's sword, put it away, uh, uh, restore it to its place. Uh, Matthew and John have him say, put your sword back in its place. But Luke heard something like that, but didn't understand what the it was and thought he meant the ear. But that's it. Jesus doesn't restore missing limbs. Why not? Right? If you could just do anything if the person had faith. But maybe it's too tall an order and people just don't have it. I'm suggesting that the 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 promise is kind of uh, uh, got a seed of its own impossibility embedded in it. Now, you can't doubt, right? And it's like the mustard seed is the doubt, really. Uh, if you have anything, as, any doubt as small as the mustard seed, forget it. Well, everybody has one, so that's why there are no mountains flying around, right? So, um...
But there is this absolute sense of faith, which I doubt if anybody has ever had. Well, I better get it going because I have that call coming in. Uh, good questions. And uh, as always, I just love going through the Gospels. And so we're stopping right in the middle of uh, chapter 11. But we'll take up that uh, tomorrow night and uh, get on through uh, a lot more of Mark, I'm sure. So thanks for being with me on the Gospel of Mark.